Hello, and welcome back to Soul's Game Dev Journey. I'm your host, and today we're diving into the fifth installment of our series, Create a Turn-Based Strategy with Unity. Last time, we dove into procedural mesh generation and created a custom editor to better control our work within the inspector. In this video, we're going to explore how we can translate mouse clicks into individual hex references within our grid. This is a key step in making our game interactive. But before we jump into that, we'll first talk about the singleton design pattern, which our mouse controller script uses. We'll discuss what a singleton is, its advantages and disadvantages, and why we're using it in our game. We'll also discuss the concept of events and how other scripts can subscribe to them. Events are a powerful tool in Unity that allow our scripts to communicate with each other in a loosely coupled way. A singleton is a design pattern that ensures only a single instance of a class can exist. It controls the instantiation process by disallowing direct creation of more than one instance, instead providing a global point of access to the single created instance. This pattern is useful in scenarios where a single instance of a class needs to control actions. Singletons are often used for things like managers for various aspects of your game, or in our case, to control mouse interactions. Now, why use a singleton? Well, there are a few advantages to this approach. First, it provides a globally accessible instance, eliminating the need for global variables. Second, it can maintain state between scenes in Unity, which can be very handy. However, like anything in programming, singletons also come with their drawbacks. If not handled correctly, they can lead to issues such as order of operation bugs, and they can make your code tightly coupled, making it hard to change or upgrade later on. That's why it's important to understand when to use this pattern, and when to opt for other solutions. In our case, we're using a singleton for our mouse controller because we need a central place to handle all mouse inputs. We only ever need one mouse controller, and we need to be able to access it from various other scripts. The singleton pattern fits perfectly for this use case. Let's look at our singleton implementation. As you can see, our singleton class is actually a generic class, meaning it can be used to create singletons of any mono behavior. The instance of the singleton is stored in a private static variable instance. We're using a lock object to ensure that only one thread can access the instance at a time, preventing potential race conditions in a multi-threaded environment. The instance is accessed via a public property instance. If the instance doesn't exist yet, it's created and attached to a new game object. In the awake method, we ensure that there's only ever one instance of the singleton in our game. If a new object of the singleton class is created, it gets destroyed immediately. The onApplicationQuit method sets a flag to prevent the instance from being recreated after the game quits. I've also added an init method. This method is marked as virtual, which means it can be overridden in any class that inherits from our singleton. The init method is intended to hold any setup code that needs to be run when an instance of the singleton is created. For example, if our mouse controller needs to initialize some variables when it is created, we could put that code in the init method of the mouse controller class. This approach keeps our initialization code organized and allows us to customize the initialization for each singleton without having to modify the singleton class itself. Now that we have a solid understanding of the singleton design pattern, let's see how it's used in practice in our mouse controller script. As you can see, our mouse controller inherits from our singleton class, meaning it follows the singleton pattern. We use the generic version of singleton, specifying mouse controller as the type parameter. This way, we ensure there's only ever one instance of mouse controller in our game. Let's walk through the script. You'll see we have three public actions, on left mouse click, on right mouse click, and on middle mouse click. These are the events that our mouse controller can raise. An action is a delegate, which is a type that safely encapsulates a method similar to a function pointer in C and C++. This action, action raycast hit, means it's an event that can be invoked with a raycast hit parameter. Next, let's look at the update method. This is a built-in Unity method that gets called every frame. Inside, we're checking if the left mouse button has been clicked. If it has, we call the check mouse click method with zero as a parameter, indicating a left mouse click. The check mouse click method is where the real magic happens. It first creates a ray from the camera through the mouse position on the screen. Then it performs a ray cast to see if this ray hits anything in our game. If it does, we check which mouse button was clicked and raise the corresponding event, passing the ray cast hit as a parameter. This way, any script that is interested in mouse clicks can subscribe to these events and react accordingly, without having to directly access the mouse controller. So, what exactly are events? Well, simply put, events are a way for an object to notify other objects when something has happened. The object that raises the event is called the publisher, and the objects that respond to the event are called subscribers. This is often referred to as the publish subscribe or observer pattern. So why are events so important in Unity? They allow us to write code that is loosely coupled. 
This means that our scripts can operate independently of each other and we can update, add, or remove scripts without having to rewrite a lot of code. It also makes our code easier to read and maintain. You might wonder, how does an event simplify communication between scripts? Let's take the example of our mouse controller. By having the mouse controller raise events when the mouse is clicked, we allow any other script that's interested in mouse clicks to react without having to know anything about the mouse controller. This greatly simplifies our code because we don't have to manually track all the scripts that might be interested in mouse clicks and call them from the mouse controller. Instead, those scripts can simply subscribe to the mouse controller's events and define what they want to do when a mouse click happens. This is a much cleaner, more efficient way to handle such interactions. As you can see at the start, our hex grid mesh generator now has methods on enable and on disable. These are special Unity methods that get called when the object the script is attached to is enabled or disabled. In on enable, we're subscribing the on left mouse click method of this class to the on left mouse click event of the mouse controller singleton. What this means is that, whenever the mouse controller raises the on left mouse click event, our on left mouse click method gets called with the same raycast hit parameter. In on disable, it's crucial to unsubscribe from the event. If we didn't, and this object were to be destroyed, the mouse controller would still try to call the on left mouse click method on the next mouse click, which would cause an error since the method no longer exists. Now, let's look at the on left mouse click method. When this method gets called, it logs the name of the object that was hit in its position. Then it calculates the local x and z coordinates of the hit point relative to the hex grid's position. Finally, it calculates the offset coordinates of the hex that was clicked using the hex metrics class and logs these coordinates. This way, we can easily find out which hex was clicked just by looking at the console output. We could expand this method to do something more useful, like highlighting the clicked hex or displaying some information about it. For demonstration purposes, I've added on right mouse click method which creates a little explosion at the center of the hex that we've clicked. As you can see, by using events, we've greatly simplified the communication between our mouse controller and hex grid mesh generator. Instead of having to keep a reference to the hex grid mesh generator in the mouse controller and call a method on it directly, we can just raise an event and let the hex grid mesh generator handle it. Let's take a moment to recap what our hex metrics class does in its role in our game. Hex metrics is a static class that contains a set of utility methods for performing calculations related to hexagons. As you can see, we have methods for getting the outer and inner radius of a hexes, for getting the corners of a hex and for getting the center point of a hex at a given column and row in our grid. These methods are essential for creating and drawing our hex grid. But for today's topic, we're more interested in the coordinate conversions and rounding methods at the bottom of the class. We've expanded the hex metrics class to handle these calculations that convert between different types of hexagon coordinates and to round fractional coordinates to the nearest whole number coordinates. In a hex grid, there are several ways to reference a hex's position. Offset coordinates are easiest to understand and work with, as they are similar to the row and column coordinates of a square grid. However, they can be awkward to use in calculations. That's where cube and axial coordinates come in. These coordinate systems are more mathematically elegant and make many calculations simpler and more efficient. Now, let's look at how we translate mouse clicks into hex references. The magic happens in the coordinate to offset method. This method takes a point in 3D space, represented by its x and z coordinates, and calculates which hex that point falls in. It does this by first converting the 3D coordinates to fractional axial coordinates, then rounding these to the nearest whole number axial coordinates, and finally converting these to offset coordinates. The calculation from 3D coordinates to fractional axial coordinates is done differently depending on whether the hex grid is pointy-topped or flat-topped. Once we have the fractional axial coordinates, we round them to the nearest whole numbers using the axial round method, which internally uses the cube round method. The rounding process works by first converting the axial coordinates to cube coordinates, then rounding each of the cube coordinates to the nearest whole number. However, since all three cube coordinates always add up to zero, we can't just round them independently. If we round two of them up, the third one will get rounded down, even if its fractional part was closer to up. To avoid this, we calculate which of the three coordinates has the largest fractional part and always round that one in the opposite direction of the other two. Finally, we convert the rounded axial coordinates to offset coordinates using the cube to offset method. This gives us the column and row of the hex that was clicked. As you can see in the Unity editor, when we click on a hex, the console logs the offset coordinates of the clicked hex, showing that our calculations are working correctly. And that wraps up our deep dive into translating mouse clicks into individual hex references. In this video, we covered a lot, 
from understanding the singleton design pattern and how it's implemented in our mouse controller to exploring event handling and the communication between different scripts via events. We also expanded our hex metrics class to handle new calculations and walk through the mathematics and logic behind translating 3D coordinates to hex grid coordinates. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and share this video with anyone else you think might be interested in game development with Unity. Your support helps me create more content like this.